We should be set. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. 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 I'm yep. not awkward. You're awkward. I, who said anything about awkward? I'm just saying. Yep, you're you're awkward. So, uh, welcome everybody to the podcast where both of us are sounding kind of sick. Are you hosting now? Apparently I am. (laughs) Well, somebody else is definitely hosting this episode because this is episode 55 of the Halcyon Frequency Podcast. I don't have the date on my document because I'm smart, which is airing live Sunday, February 5th, 2023. I'm blind and I'm hosting because I'm not going to let Suey host and Suey is also here and we're, we're going to be talking about the games that we've been playing this week and some newsy stuff later. So how are you doing today, Suey? I'm doing good. I'm still getting over the flu even though I had it like a week ago. So that's fun. Like I feel fine, but I sound pretty sniffly. Um, I had to spend two weeks without streaming because I was sick and that sucked. So it's nice to be back at least. And you know, I'm slowly getting my work done, which is nice, because, dude, things become just a disaster when you're doing the bare minimum, you know? As somebody who makes it his policy to only do the bare minimum and never do more than the bare minimum, I, I would like to just inform you that if all you do is the bare minimum, then nothing really becomes a disaster. Well, okay, but I consider bare minimum, like, not even cleaning. That's bare minimum. Like, cleaning is bare minimum. I'm calling bare minimum, bare minimum to survive. Eat food, inhale oxygen, sleep. Yeah. Have bucket next to bed. Oof. That wasn't that bad. Okay, good. I, <laughs> it I wasn't mean, the stomach flu. It was just like uh, horrible, horrible snot. Oh my uh, yeah, 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 yeah. gosh. Just a little, very mucusy flu. Yeah, it was just ugh, it was straight mucus, man. I got a very mild head cold which became annoying enough that I had to end a few streams early, but I still streamed for like nine and a half hours on those days. So, um, you know, it was yeah. just like, a, guys, I'm losing my voice. It's it's time for me to go do something else now. What happened to me is I had like really bad fatigue for a week. I think it was just like a standard cold mm-hmm. and I felt pretty much fine, but I just had horrible fatigue and I was only up for a few hours at a time. And then as soon as I got over that, Sue boy came down with the flu, and then I caught it from him. Mm. So, well, blame Sue boy. Stop being around other humans, and then you won't get sick. Have no friends. Well, Makes life much easier. I'm sorry, but uh, Sue boy and I kind of share like a 24 foot trailer, so we can't really not no. be next to each other all no, the just time. Don't si- simply don't leave the trailer. I think you misunderstood yeah, but my statement. Yeah, Boy leaves the trailer. Well, don't leave the trailer, and then you won't get sick. <laughs> I'm Sue just, I'm just promoting the hermit lifestyle. Okay, like <laughs> you know, you, 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 you've like you've seen the trends online, right? You've seen the tiny home trends. You've seen the self sustainability trends. You've seen the uh, living off the grid trends. Well, how about just the have no friends trends? <laughs> um, so Boy's been like helping out with the middle schools wrestling teams uh stuff like he's coaching well that's how you get sick <laughs> yeah <laughs> <That'll> do <it. laughs> and he doesn't it's, get it's... sick easy right he barely ever gets sick but like it's a thing he gets sick once with the flu every winter right that's so not barely getting sick i barely get sick i get a cold maybe once every five years no no no, no. i don't think you understand Back when I lived with my family, I would catch something at least once a month. Now it's like I catch something like once a month during the winter and then I'm not sick at all in the summer, basically. Dude, that that is like just not normal. <laughs> I've always gotten sick really easy. I mean, my immune system was kind of broken uh, back where I used to live because I always had like really bad allergies going on all the time. And now I still have allergies, but it's nothing like it was back where I grew up. Um, because, you know, I grew up with lots of green, lots of grass, lots of trees everywhere, lots of bushes. Heaven. I'm in the desert now, so there's not as much to actually make my allergies go ham. Mm. You know, because I'm not, I'm not super allergic to dust. The only time I'm allergic to dust is, like, when it's in a house. 
and I touch it, then I'll get hives. Well, I mean, that but technically like, means that you're allergic to human skin, which is perfectly normal. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I believe like 80% it if I was allergic of dust is human skin. <laughs> I believe it if I was allergic to human skin. You know, I have eczema. I've had it my whole life. Um, so, like, I'm constantly itchy. I'm always, like, a very aware of my skin and so thinking I, I about what, what I said, touch. But I heard that as eczema. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm now just imagining, like, a Humpty Dumpty anime. But yeah, <laughs> but like I'm always very aware of what I'm touching and I don't like touching like fabric, for example, that's, I don't know like how it's been cleaned or if it's been cleaned, right? Because yep. it might have something on it that I can't touch and then I'll get hives and that's no fun. And so I'm always super aware of that. But one time I, it just got so bad. I went to the doctor and they gave me some steroids, like oral steroids, you know? Uh, which is what they do for uh, allergic reactions that aren't, like, EpiPen level, but they're on the more severe side. Yeah, it's a severe allergic reaction. Yeah. Or a severe and response. It was so cool. I didn't, like, feel my skin anymore in the way that I Wait. feel it normally. I was going to say, that's cool? Yeah. Because usually I'm hyper aware of it, and it always feels, like, kind of tight and dry. Huh. And it wasn't that way. So I, I'm know? numb to my body's existence. Because I have this thing called chronic pain, where I'm just always in pain. So my way of like dealing with it is I do my best to forget about it. So I like at times will realize I can't feel my hands. Oh, like at all, because like my body just like shuts down the existence of the pain that I'm constantly feeling, which Wait. is weird because like I used to remember what it was like to feel my body back in like you know five six years ago before i had all of these weird annoying problems that developed hold up um if you can't like, feel your hand can you feel what your hand is touching no wait what so like i i, I can't i can feel my hand but i have to focus on it. i have to think about it like i, I have okay. to very it, like you know when like people on the internet are like oh you're now breathing in manual like i, I mean it has no effect on me but i have to like focus on what I'm touching to be able to feel it because my hand's always in pain. Uh, right? So like I like I, I have I have chronic nerve damage, right? So like all everything hurts all the time. All the time. Wow. Every everything that has like a nerve ending hurts. Uh it's especially bad in my chest and especially bad in my legs. But like if I put my hand on my desk, I don't necessarily notice that my hand is on my desk until I think about what my hand is touching. Okay, so if you touch something textured, do you notice the texture right away? Like, instantly, are you thinking about that or, like, processing that, oh, this has, like, I don't know, I'm touching wood right now and I can feel the grain? I guess it depends. Am I reaching out and grabbing something or am I just absentmindedly resting my hand on a thing? I'd say, like, actively touching it. If I'm actively touching it, yes. Okay. But, like, if I'm absentmindedly, like, resting my hand somewhere and not thinking about it, I won't notice what I'm touching. I mean, I think people don't really necessarily think about that. You're, like, I don't know. I'm not actively thinking about it when I'm touching my mouse. But, like, if I think about it for even half a second, I'm like, yes, my mouse has, like, like, a spot where my finger goes. And that's, like, a lot smoother than, like, the rest of my mouse. It's slightly textured. But but to give you an idea, like, I, I have the before and after thoughts of what this was like, right? So I, I remember what it was like to just, like, be aware of textures and things. And since, like, massive nerve damage, um, I, I now have to almost recalibrate my brain to be like, what am I touching right now? Oh. Wait, like, wait, I have so a question. You Can you notice? feel your clothes? Like, I'm assuming you're wearing clothes, right? Can yes. you feel your clothes? I mean, yeah, if I think about it a tiny bit. Like, are, are you aware of all of those textures at all times? Not at all times. Because I, I I don't even notice it. I tunnel vision really hard, and I don't notice things around me. Like, I'm not a very perceptive person. That's kind of just who I am. So, like, things can be happening around me, and if I'm, like, hyper-focused on a task, I have no idea what's going on around me. Um, huh. But, like, okay, do you have problems, like, with your hands getting too dry? Like, do you notice when your hands are really dry or, like, if they get I, sticky? I, I live or? in somewhere that's very, like, temperate and not a desert. So if I go to a no, desert, no, no. yeah, my skin when will dry I lived up. in 
When I lived in a temperate biome, my skin was drier than it is in the desert. My skin when is I lived so in a temperate biome in, in Minecraft, I built my house and then a creeper blew it up. Sorry. <laughs> but I kid you not, my skin is so much more moist in the desert. Like, yeah, so I we had the same experience where his skin dried the heck out when we visited my family. I, I've never... Uh, that That to me actually sounds like the house that you lived in. No, 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 we didn't. Personally, but... We barely went over to their house. We were mostly yeah, I, in an Airbnb. I've never had a problem with dry skin, period. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I can't relate to that at all. Yeah, I say that as I'm, like, the only time that I've on my hands. The only time I've had dry skin issues is, like, while camping for four days straight in direct sunlight. Oh. Especially in snow, actually. Like, I, I will get... I, I have to bring, like, uh, stuff to put on my lips and whatnot. And, like, oh. moisturizer for my hands on snow. When I grew up in the... When it was cold in winter, um, spots like my knuckles would literally just split open because it was so dry. Nope. Never had an issue. Like, the skin would just split open and become this, like, fairly deep wound. But, like, if I, if I go to Vegas for, like, three days, my hands will get a little dry. But, um, interesting, interesting conversation for the starters of this. How have you been the past <laughs> few weeks aside from just like, you know, being sick? Uh, I've been in bed mostly because I was sick. <laughs> well, you, did you play any video games while you were in bed? Uh, not in bed. I've been playing like a good variety of games while sick, though. Like, I have a, um, I've talked about this a good amount, but I have what I call a no guilt game list on my Steam that I can, like, go to and play whenever I want. So, from that list, I've been playing a lot of Dead in Vinland, which is this, um, management sim slash there is turn based combat. Uh, and it's like, you're this Viking family that crashed on this, uh, beach and you have to, like, build up a place to live and- I'm very sad that you said beach and not alien planet because that would have been way cooler. Just like yeah. space Vikings. <laughs> no, no, no. Aww. And then I've also been playing Train Valley 2 a good amount, which is my train game. Um, good I call it my game. train game. You, yeah, 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 you played it. Yeah, yeah, We talked about this it's, one. It's puzzle but... game. On, on the whole games topic side, I think it's time for us to go to a real quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about the games that we've been playing this week. And we're back with episode 55 of the Halcyon Frequency Podcast. So, Suey. Yeah. I've been playing a lot of Trackmania recently. Well, maybe not a lot, vroom, but I've vroom. been getting back into uh, Trackmania because okay. uh, Trackmania, uh, the one video game that I acknowledge the existence of from Ubisoft, uh, released on Steam. So Trackmania is uh, a guilty pleasure of mine. A um, little bit of history. Trackmania has been a series that I've played on and off since the first one I encountered in 2007. Um, it is a weird, weird, weird game. Um, I think it's currently sitting at 70% positive reviews on Steam, which is fair. Um, it's certainly not a game for everybody. Um, it is not actually free to play, even though it claims to be. It's a subscription game. Um, the free version, uh, which is what's available on Steam, is a uh, sort of a demo. You can play the uh, public tracks, which are basically like made by the developers of the game and there it's like a single player time trial kind of thing and then um the there is a uh, custom track of the day which is a user made track that anybody can play and then there uh, are some other hoppers that you can jump into to just play tracks that people have made as a free player but for like $14 a year <laughs> um you can just get access to all their custom servers which are wild and uh, that's mm -hmm. where the the game actually gets good um, it's basically just the game where up to 500 people can race around one track at a time, time trial wise, uh, which as a competitive multiplayer game is, uh, maybe the only game that I consistently return to these days as a competitive multiplayer game. Essentially, it's just, you go really fast around the track for five minutes and try and get the best time possible. And then it ranks you based on your time. You don't interact with other players at all. And the chat's almost always super positive of just like, oh yeah, you, you like, there's a trick at this spot. And like people helping each other. Cause everybody just wants people to go faster. Um, and it's, it's a game that can like deceptively eat a lot of time. And it's just a really fun, like, Little racing game, and I like to go fast around tracks. Mm -hmm. 
So, so I'm, I'm happy it's finally on Steam now. Uh, I have somewhere I'm going with this, but what's the name of the words that like are sound words? You know, like um, meow or moo, where like they sound like what they're describing. Do you know? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, hold on. Let me go to Google. Uh, <laughs> what are sound words called? Uh, Soup Boy just talked in my ear and thinks it's an onomatopoeia. An, yeah, an onomatopoeia oh, is, is, is in fact the, the word. Like, that's what I got in dictionary. Uh, is the forming of a word by imitating the sound of the word it is referring to, as in bang, meaning a loud explosive sound, and meow, meaning a, a sound a cat makes. It's an yes. onomatopoeia. Okay. Not to be confused with an onomatoguchi. Um, would you say that the onomatopoeia for Trapmania is it's your vroom vroom game? Well, personally... My car doesn't make a vroom vroom sound. Um, it okay. makes uh, uh, somebody going. So it's a raspberry sound. Game. Uh, well, because you can customize the sound that your car makes. Or is it more of a chug? If, if you want a car that just goes, that just makes fart sounds, you could do that. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I, I now, I th now that I think about it, I need to change my horn sound to Mushroom Kingdom, here we come. Because that would be fantastic. I don't know the reference. I'm sorry. Watch the watch the trailer for the Super Mario Brothers movie. It's Chris uh, Pratt being Mario sounding horrible. And he says, okay. Mushroom Kingdom, here we come in that trailer. And it sounds awful and it became a meme. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So with me babbling about Trackmania for a minute, I, I've heard that you've been playing uh, some Halo. Yeah, so... On my stream, I do a 50,000 channel point reward rate where basically once someone has watched my stream long enough to obtain 50,000 channel points, uh, they can redeem it and pick a game for me to play at some point, which I only guarantee like an hour of gameplay, but I'll play through the whole game if I really enjoy it, you know? Um, and Halo was on that, so I've been playing through the first Halo game, which is also known Combat Evolved, I think, Halo or Combat Extended. Evolved, yes. Okay, evolved. Yeah, so it's combat evolved, and um, and, yeah, and you're playing through the it. anniversary collection, correct? Yes, I'm playing the um, Master Chief collection thing. So how far have you gotten in? Because I, I, I'm assuming, because um, you put it on this list, I'm assuming you're enjoying it enough to play the whole thing. Like how far in? Are yeah, you? I am. I'm at the point where I met the flood, the Ooh. and I just beat the library, which is okay. like. The one okay. where you follow the AI thing, the AI that turns out to be evil and is going to, like, eradicate all living beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where I ended. Okay. Um, was that all in one sitting? No, this is, like, okay. three settings. Okay. Um, so Halo is one of my favorite games from my childhood. Um, I acquired it from the Swedish Public Library a very long time ago and then later bought a, a copy of it from a store, um, which I probably still have the disc version around somewhere. I, I don't actually own the anniversary collection or anything, but um, I, I played through Halo maybe like 20, 30 times when I was little. Um, and uh, there there is so many moments in Halo that like... I mean, I mean, for for back in the day, like when Halo came out, like it certainly wasn't the craziest shooter of all time. Like it was kind of slow, actually. Um, it was definitely like one of the, like the pinnacle of console shooters at the time. So like con con shooters that you'd play with a controller. Um, but as a mouse and keyboard game, it was always like a little bit slow and sluggish. But it did a lot of things at the time that were super unique that I think made it stand out, at least for me as a little kid playing it. And I remember like there was a lot of moments for me as a little kid playing halo like oh this is the future of video games right um and like you've seen all these sequences now so like none of this is spoilers but you know like that that opening sequence when you're when you're running through the uh the ship right at the very beginning the uh the pillar of autumn i think um yeah yeah, yeah. yeah when you're running through the ship and like you know you, you come around all these corridors and you see the soldiers and they're just like fighting off with the grunts and then like a grenade goes off on the ground and they fall down and their grenades fall out of their like inventory and then like another grenade goes off and then those grenades explode just like those kind of almost oh, um yeah, like kind of systems reactions. heavy events like 
um, when I when I was around that same age, I was also playing through um, a lot of immersive sims, games like Arx Fatalis. And um, uh, if you're unfamiliar with uh, immersive sim for you or just anybody listening, immersive sims are, are games that here's a lot of systems. And then the player gets to interact with these systems and make interesting events happen with those systems. And that can be things like, you know, putting out torches. That can be things like knocking out, uh, like light fixtures are an easy one, or like opening and closing doors or like moving gates or physics items and objects. And uh, you can throw things like, oh, I could stab him with this sword or I could throw the sword at him. And Halo for me kind of had a much more approachable feeling for that same kind of idea slash game design where you know, like guns are physics objects. Grenade go off, gun go flying, and they or like guy drop a gun and the gun goes off, and it's cool, cool little things like that. So uh, I'm just I'm I'm curious if like that kind of feeling holds up, or if you've had anything like that. Like so, me being a person who's played a lot of games but has never played Halo before, to me, I just feel like I'm like it definitely almost feels like I'm just playing a current game. I'm playing with the new graphics. I do press, so uh, the thing is, is they have new and old graphics and you can just press tab on your keyboard at any point to change the graphics. And it's really cool because, you know, you get to see. I'm playing with new graphics just because it's shiny and- I'll say this, <laughs> it's shiny. I've seen footage of Halo um, Anniversary. The new graphics are how I remember Halo looking. Oh, really? Yeah. Even though I obviously played it with the old graphics back in the day, like when I look at the new graphics, I'm like, oh yeah, that's Halo. It it just looks like kind of the same game to me. Like Halo obviously, it triggers like it. more memory when I see the original graphics, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, no, that's that's the same game basically. Yeah, I like the shiny new graphics. Um, and I forgot where I was going with this. Oh yeah, no, no, no. it plays like a modern shooter kind of. I mean, it's floaty. I noticed it was very floaty, and it's kind of taken me a while to like understand how that works especially because there's like moments where you kind of have to parkour a little bit and so like it took me a while to understand how the jump works just because it is so floaty and i'm used to pretty tight controls um beyond that like it's been really fun i really like how they kind of force you to use a large variety of weapons with the guns you know you can't just use one gun over and over because you're going to run out of ammo so you have to eventually switch you might you know you often have to end up switching to the aliens weapons and that yeah. was kind of an interesting thing the the weapon switching stuff because on in old pc shooters like let's just say quake um or unreal or a game that was very pc focused you just had all the guns at all time and hmm. um when, when halo came out there was memory limitations on the xbox because this was an original xbox game right <laughs> um and it came out in 2001 for a little bit of like clarity's sake on how old this game is um the original Xbox had memory limitations. So the player could only have a certain number of guns equipped at a time. So that is actually like a, a memory limitation and a mechanical limitation of the game at the time that they, I think, did a really good job making up for. Instead of just giving you a couple of guns and it's really boring, it's like it turns into a, well, I can only have two guns equipped and grenades, right? So I'm just going to throw this on the ground and pick this up and then start running around with this, um, which you know, leads to some really interesting, fun kind of, like, play. And it's and, and Halo is still that way to this day. That's, like, still kind of a um, a thing that Halo does where it just it becomes, like, a resource management of, like, all right, well, this has 90 shots and this has 12, so screw this. Even though it's a good gun, I'll pick up this other thing. Um, yep. Or, like, when you are running into a room and just butting guys with the butt of your gun because you want to keep the gun that you have. Yep. No, or, I really like it because, like, uh, it forces you to try guns that you normally wouldn't try and weapons you wouldn't normally try. And I like that because I'm the type of person who finds something they like and feels like is OP and just sticks to it. So kind of being forced to try new things is really nice and it's a nice change of pace. Do, so, so something that like uh, also really stood out to me about the game at the time was just like th the way that the different enemies interact with you. And this is also something that I think is really, really cool and influential and important about Halo at the time. Like you run into a room with grunts and they run away screaming. <laughs> right like sometimes they'll throw a grenade at you and they'll turn around and run um or like the elites will like dodge out of the way of your abilities i'm just curious if you have like a, a favorite enemy type or any kind of cool moments that you've had in the the game leading up because I, I know like at the point where the flood shows up like you've already like you've seen the library uh you've run around on the surface a whole bunch you've been in the underground sequences like do you, do you have a, a favorite enemy type that you've encountered Ooh, favorite enemy type 
I don't know. That's hard. Um, honestly, I love like when the grunts are sleeping and you can just kind of sneak by and go boop, boop, boop to all of them. You know, like that's one of my smack favorite em. things. Yeah, you could just like go by all the grunts and just smack them. Which is really fun because like you just watch them sleep and you're just like, hmm. If I don't shoot, none of you will wake up and warn the others. So trying to be sneaky in the game is fun because like it's really hard. And, like, it's okay if you mess up. You can fight. It's meant to be able to fight the whole thing. So, like, trying to be sneaky on occasion is fun. That, that, that also leads into a little bit of, like, the why it feels a little bit like an immersive sim, even though it's, you know, very much not that flexible like an immersive sim. But, like, you know, the, the environments are pretty big, right? Like, it is, it is a corridor shooter to a degree, but there are some levels, which I, I can't actually remember if you've gotten to these or not, so I won't be specific. But, like, there are some levels that are just, like, it's a map, and you can just walk anywhere on the map. Yeah, no, I've had some like that. Uh, the ones that are, like, on the surface. Um, and there's, like, a huge area, you know? like there's a big old base I'm... assault area where, like, uh, you have to get, get into the Banshee and then fly in. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I think that's the level with the tank in it, too. Yeah, 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 it is. I played that one. Mm -hmm. That one was really hard, actually. What difficulty are you playing on? I'm a playing on normal, but I'm not a shooter player, you know? Yeah, like, no, that's fine. The most shooters I've really done is Killing Floor 2, which I have like 100 hours in, you know? Yeah. I'm not a shooter player, so For... I'm over here playing, you know, normal difficulty, and I still find that hard, mm -hmm. you know, because I just don't have those skills built in. I There are certain, like, things that I just don't know because I just don't play the genre. Yeah, I, I, I will say my favorite way to play Halo is on easy. Really? Oh, yeah. Just uh, like the, 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 like, cause I, I, I played through that game many, many times and I always played it on a laptop touchpad. So mm -hmm. not only was I like limited, like I played through the most recent Halo on, on PC, right? Um, Halo Infinite played through that entire campaign. I played through it on normal, but like Halo Combat Evolved, the vast majority of the time I have playing that game was all on easy. Just experimenting and messing around and seeing what I can do because, like, at a point, the game becomes like a weird physics sandbox, especially when you get like the vehicles and stuff. Like, there's some weird areas yeah. that you can get to and some fun glitches you can mess around with if you played the game a whole lot. Um, but you know, I, 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 I never beat it on legendary. I've never done any of that stuff. But like, I, I always found that like playing Halo on different difficulties kind of changes the way you play the game. You have to play it more like an immersive sim on hard. But on like normal or the lower difficulties, you have a lot more freedom to just kind of goof off. And I think that that's where Halo is the best, you know? Like the enemies all react in, with so much personality. Like the little dudes with the shields that are kind of like grunts, but not quite, that just like hide behind the shields and then you smack the shield yeah. and they turn around and run away with the shield over their head. Like finding those interactions to me is more fun than being like, okay, how am I going to, I'm going to hide behind this. I'm going to throw a grenade over this and then I'll pop out and shoot one guy in the head. Like that's playing Halo on hard is like, okay, you have to play it like a very tactical game, which is fun. I, I like to be a rampaging killing God. I actually do have to play it kind of tactically because, you know, for me playing on normal is like for a shooter player playing on, I don't know. Is there something between hard and legendary? Heroic, yep. Subway answered for me. So, like, me playing on normal is pr probably fairly similar to, like, the average person who plays shooters playing on heroic, right? Like, I... That's kind of just my skill level, and I'm happy to accept that as my skill level. I have a very high skill level on other things, you know? So, I do have to think things through. You know, I do die a good amount, and I have to, like, figure out how to live, like... Very early on the game, I've realized I have to actually utilize cover, which is not something I've ever had to do in a shooter game that I've played too much. I did a tiny bit in um, Tomb Raider, but not that much. This game is, like, really big on optimizing your use of cover and stuff, which has been, like, a learning curve for me. Um, I, I have a question. How do you feel about uh, the Warthog? The Warthog? Oh, it's fun. Um okay. I like War trying is to my get it into places you're not supposed game. to. I really like the Banshee because you can like actually fly and stuff. You like the Banshee. Yeah. You you found a ghost, right? Those those are like the Banshees. The, the ghosts the, the are hover, fun, yeah, but I I think I like the, the Banshees pew, pew, pew. better. Gotcha. Yeah, my because my favorite vehicle in a video game is the Warthog. Okay. Yeah, uh, and that's why I I in uh, my, the most fun I had with Halo Infinite. Um, in the first few weeks that Halo Infinite was out was just 
get into a warthog with somebody on discord in the gun spot and somebody else on discord in the in the side seat because i learned very quickly the first week that halo infinite was out that nobody knows how to drive a warthog properly so the fact that i could drive a warthog properly means that i could just like zip around the map really fast never get hit very rarely die and uh we went like 35 and 0 every single match for like the first week mm -hmm. that that game was out and some of the most fun i've had with games in the last like five years at least with a multiplayer game um i like but, how uh, with the warthog at least in halo one like you turn your camera and it just like 360s mm -hmm. yeah it's it's such a it's such a silly like control mechanism but it works so well on controller and translates weirdly well to keyboard and mouse too it's uh yeah it's it's just nothing control nothing in video games controls like vehicles in halo yeah it's kind of I a play on thing. keyboard and mouse, but it's yep. just like it's so fun because you just like flick your mouse and then like it's like doing this really sharp turn, dude. I like end up making the warthog flip over a ridiculous amount too. <laughs> oh, it's it's so fun, and then you just jump, you just you get out, you hit the button, and then you jump back in. Yep, you just keep going. Yeah, it's yep. it's it's a good time. The warthogs are are, are good fun. At um in uh the multiplayer modes for every Halo game, there's a mode called Forge, and uh, Forge is uh, custom maps and they're usually just like blocks floating in space but like you could go warthog bowling except what you're bowling against is everybody's in a warthog and one person has a rocket launcher and you're going down a big hill well, okay i've seen suboy playing multiplayer where like everyone's like running around and trying to avoid being hit by like snipers yeah or like and falling it's, like, blocks a obstacle course type thing giant soccer balls yeah yeah, it's, it's called a... what? Duck Hunt. He really likes Duck Hunt. Duck Hunt. Okay. Yeah. No, there, there, there's oh, no, a lot he of likes really infection. good custom Sorry. Ones. Sorry. I got it wrong. He likes Duck Infection. But oh, Duck the, Hunt the, isn't the, a the version of gotcha. Infection. Uh, yeah. yeah no, I don't um, know. I don't play multiplayer. I'm only doing the single player. I am... I don't like PvP in terms that, of like... That's what Forge is FPS. for. So you just play... It's, it's like playing party minigames, basically. <laughs> That's fair. I did really like, um, back in the day, I used to play Minecraft a lot, and I mm -hmm. really liked going on the Hive, which was, like, the big server of mini games. Gotcha. That, and then, um, oh, there was another one, but I can't remember off the top of my head. And there was this one that was just, um, where it would, like, tell you a color of block to stand on, you would stand on it, and then all the others would fall. And I got really good at that one. That was my favorite one. Yep. Yeah, no, uh, I, I guess the final Halo question I have, uh, because I don't want to, you know, spoil anything about Halo, so I'm being a little bit careful about talking openly about one of my favorite games ever made, um, but uh, <laughs> do you have a favorite gun? Ooh, favorite gun. I love the sniper rifle. Like the sniper? Mm -hmm, like that? Oh, the, 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 the one level which I can never remember the name of where you're, like, assaulting the alien ship, I think? Where you just get a sniper yeah. rifle? I can't remember if you've done that one yet. Oh, yeah, 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 I think I and have. They come down um, from the ship? School. Yeah, I think so, vaguely. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just really fun. I like the sniper rifle because I like uh, you know, hiding and then like especially getting the ones that are on the turrets, just like pop and then no more turret anymore. Pop, no more turret. And it's just I... like really satisfying when you actually hit them, like if you hit more than one shot in a row, it's just like hee hee hee. I have uh two favorites for Halo One, and that's the the, the trusty sidearm pistol, because you can headshot almost anything to death. Um, it gets worse in other Halos, so it's my favorite pistol, favorite variant of the pistol, and uh, I really like the Needler. It's just so weird. The Needler so isn't good in the Halo. first one, though. Hmm. I've been told the Needler gets a lot better after the first. Oh, definitely. One. But it's because, it's just like, so uniquely Halo. Yeah, it's just like I can't figure it out, and I swear every time I use it, I die within thirty seconds. So That's I fair. try to avoid it. You have to basically fill the enemy up with a whole clip, and then it'll one shot like anything. Yeah, but then you can't be too close to the enemy, or yeah. it explodes and kills you. Yep. And I'm really bad at. I can hardly do grenades without killing myself at moments. <laughs> so stickies are pretty good, though. St stickies are pretty good. I haven't found those yet. I'm pretty sure you get stickies on the first level. It's the grenades that the aliens drop that are blue and glowy. Oh, the plasma ones. Yeah, those are stickies. They they stick to enemies if you hit them with it. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can like Well, that's new knowledge to me. <laughs> you can like 
throw a grenade, land it in the middle of a gr of grunts, and like it gets stuck to one of their hands, and then they run away going, ah! and then they explode. It's great. That's amazing. It's a good time. I didn't know that. Or like if there's like a, a a banshee or something flying at you, you throw that, and it gets stuck to the banshee, and it flies away. It's stuck to the banshee. <laughs> The weird thing is, I keep getting my grenade and melee buttons mixed up. Time to rebind your keys. Yeah, but if I rebind it now, I'm going to get even more mixed up. <laughs> so I'm kind of like stuck with it. Uh, fair. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah. Well, speaking of being confused and mixed up, uh, I'm going to talk about Caves of Cud for a minute. All right. So I, I've dove back into Caves of Cud. Um, Caves of Cud is still wonderful. Um, for those of you who are unaware, Caves of Cud is a traditional roguelike, um, to the literal most, uh, impenetrable nightmare degree. Um, if you've played traditional roguelikes, it's a pretty easy one to get into. If you haven't, I would imagine it would be a daunting task indeed. Uh, but they've added a bunch of new endgame content, so I'm trying to, uh, p puddle my way through it slowly. Um, I've, I've, I've done a, a build twice with two different characters, um, and, uh, a chat asked me very nicely to take quantum jitters. Now, quantum jitters is an ability or a, a defect, right? So in, in when you're making your character in Caves of Cud, you can uh, select defects, which give you more uh, character points to build your character, and it uh, lets mm -hmm. you have uh, basically like more, more points to spend on skills, right? Yep. Um, quantum jitters gives you a lot. But the problem with quantum jitters is whenever you use an activated ability, uh, there's a percent chance that the game doesn't tell you uh, that you might accidentally tear a hole in space-time and spawn two black holes, oh. which you have no control over. And if you fall into the black holes, then you're just somewhere else. <laughs> uh, where? Oh. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so you might land in the end of the game. You might land in the starting town. You might just be somewhere in the wilderness near a goat village uh, right in front of a dude with a shotgun. Um you just appear somewhere else. But what's even better is it'll also rip out whatever else is in the area, and they'll also go to that same place. Um, oh. So I've had many great moments with this mind power psionic character I've been playing where I'll just be walking through and I'll, like, you know, be shooting my laser eyeballs at things and, like, using my disintegrate spell to, like, blast my way through stuff. And I'll be trekking along and then suddenly, wormhole! <laughs> um, and I'm somewhere else. Or, alternatively, it misses me and just sucks up all the enemies across me, and then they're somewhere else, so it sucks to be them. Um, but uh, I've, I've appeared in some very fun spots. Um, fortunately, the game gives you some outs for this, right? There are these um, items that are initially described as small stones, which are basically teleportation devices that allow you to teleport to certain locations in the game. And I have a few of these. I just have to make sure they're always powered in, in my pocket uh, so that when I teleport somewhere, I can just simply, if I'm in somewhere scary, I can just put up my shield because I have a little mind power shield. And then I pull up my teleportation device, which takes a few turns, but the shield keeps me safe. And then I go to somewhere else, um, back home, basically. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's very, very amusing to just be like in a dungeon and just like, shooting your uh, things and firing shotguns and like throwing stuff and doing the stuff that you normally do in caves of cud talking to sentient plants and uh trying to convince people to join you and then killing them because they didn't um it's 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 a good time and then suddenly it's like bang i'm somewhere else now um which very very fun i i really really like caves of cud i just I, I wish it was more accessible to people because i think that that is genuinely maybe one of the greatest games made in the last 10 years and i don't think it'll ever be recognized for that yeah like i haven't it, played it, it so i don't know it does have some accessibility things i don't i don't actually know if any of this even sounds interesting to you but the game is a lot of reading right like it's very much oh. like all of the all of the world building and lore like there's no voice acting or anything it's like it's all text um, yeah i'm checked all, out all of, uh. <laughs> all of the world building and lore is like you hit l and you look at items and you're reading descriptions of stuff but it it has two modes that they've added that makes it a lot more accessible the first mode for caves of cud that they've added is um role play uh, Roleplay lets you save at towns. Um, so anytime you get to a neutral town, the game automatically saves um, instead of killing your character so you could lose like a 20-hour save, <laughs> which is what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it, it just puts you back to the nearest town, um, which is, I think, actually a very fair way of doing it because it gives you like the ability to go get save points in between uh, going into dungeons and stuff. Um, or there's the second one, which is Wander, which is really interesting. It allows you to save anywhere at any time. Um, I think that or it's just save at towns, but anyway, it allows you to save. Um, and also, uh, 
removes basically all the combat from the game. So um, it makes almost all entities neutral to you and gives you significantly more XP for exploration. So you get XP for just like exploring normally and like finding locations and stuff, but it rebalances the game. So instead of you going out into zones to like beat the crap out of fish and crocodiles for a bit to get to level five, so you can go do the first couple quests, um, just going to the quest location will give you the level that you need basically. Um, mm. Which is really interesting if you just want to play it like kind of a very passive RPG. Um, I mean, uh, it plays more like a CRPG because it's got a lot of text, but um, it's like, actually maybe, I think saying a lot of text is maybe doing it a, dis a disservice. It's no more text than like your average story-based game, but there there is a few blocks of exposition where it's like, okay, I'm reading like a paragraph of text, which is going to like explain my next quest and what I need to do and a bunch of character dialogue. But um, a lot of the reading is optional. Like you don't need to look at the description of everything, but if you really want the flavor of the world, Looking at the description of each new enemy type once is probably a good idea. That sounds kind of similar to Dwarf Fortress. Not really. In a way. Like, the idea that it has all this lore that you can read, but you don't have to. Dwarf Fortress oh, is sure. very much that yeah. way, too. I mean, I, they, they're, they're two games, and, like, the developers of Dwarf Fortress and the developers of Caves of Cud are friends, right? And Caves of Cud takes okay. a lot of inspiration from Dwarf Fortress. One thing that Caves mm -hmm. of Cud does that's really interesting is it has written lore, right? Like, the world is designed. The world map doesn't change, but the locations on the world map change, and the layouts of the, of the individual tiles that, the, that, in, that builds the world map change from run to run. But every single time you start a new run, like a new playthrough, uh, it scrambles its own history. So there oh. are a handful of pre-written characters which are identical every single time, and there are designed locations which are similar each time because they're very uh, hand-built. Uh, there is variation each time, but they're hand-built. So it's like a CRPG that scrambles its history, so the order things happen in, the characters you'll read about and learn about that will give you XP bonuses for learning about them. Like, to give you an idea, there's a specific character in the game uh, named Recef. And if you read about Recef, and you go to a specific different character in a specific redacted location of the game, and you talk to this person, you'll get XP simply for learning about this one character. And this one character will have statues throughout the world in random locations, and as you and you'll find these like uh, bits of information quite quickly from like things like uh, writings on the side of a um, uh, on the side of a, a clay pot in like a dungeon somewhere uh, and okay. it'll be a painted pot, and that pot will have a bit of history from this character, and then you can go turn that history in to make to get XP. Do you have to read all the little like three line blurbs about this character? No, you don't have to. You could completely skip it and just go cash in the XP and play it mechanically. But if you wanted to play it as a game where you're learning about these narratives, you can do that. And also on top of that, there's there are these characters called the Sultans, right? Which are like the the um, important historical leaders of, of the world, which change every single run with the exception of Recef, who's the written one. Um, and you can collect their histories and learn about items that they had and as you're collecting their histories going through each unique world, um, like, let's just say uh, Sultan number three uh, was born as a small baby, was adopted by monkeys, lived with the monkey tribe, was raised by monkeys, uh, went out to preach, like, the, hist the, the histories and the teachings of the monkeys to other peoples, made friends with somebody, killed somebody's pet, and got booted out by this faction, and uh, uh, in battle became friends with this other faction, which explains why these two factions are friends in this particular playthrough, and um, lost a battle axe in this location. And then the, when you find the, 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 the bit where he lost a battle axe, it then gives you that location, and you can go to that location, mm. do a randomly generated dungeon, acquire that battle axe, and then you have a rad battle axe with a name. Okay. You like games that give you a lot of options, I feel like. I like options, and I like replayability. And mm -hmm. I like depth. We're very different. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, C Caves of Cut is an incredible game for a specific kind of person. If you're not that kind of person, it's totally fine. But I just, I like to talk about Caves of Cud because it is Dune meets Alice in Wonderland. And it's fantastic. Fair enough. So that's, that's my chunk to say about Caves of Cut. It'll be out of early access at some point in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it does, it'll release on phones. And I might never play another video game again after that. Well... Speaking of getting back to games, uh, mm -hmm. I decided to resub to Final Fantasy the other day, Final Fantasy XIV. Why would you do that? Who hurt you? What do you, you? mean? <laughs> I love the game. Who it's hurt you, game. Suey? Why are you playing that? Okay, come on. Uh, but I had 
gotten rid of my sub for a few months just because like I had gotten bored I didn't really have like something I wanted to do but I've just been miss I've started to miss it a bunch in the past couple weeks so I decided to go ahead and get it back up and it's really weird playing again um I'm just slowly making it through the story doing dailies that kind of thing um and you know I have several patches worth of story to go through so that's really really fun you know um and I got to do some uh, daily roulettes with my friend the other day, which is just where it throws you into a dungeon, a random dungeon, and you get rewards for doing it. Uh, so, yeah. So, have, have they added enough to in, the, in the time that you've, like, fixed your boredom issues with the game then? Well, yeah, before I was, like, fully caught up on everything. Mm, so now okay. I'm behind so no, on you story. Just, you were just stuck on dailies then at that point. Yeah, I was just stuck on dailies and like I could go do hardcore stuff, but I didn't really want to put in the um, commitment to do the hardcore stuff because it takes a lot of hours gotcha. and you have to like work really hard to like perfect your rotation and everything that you're using. So um, I just got bored because I was mostly just doing dailies. So I've swapped. Now I'm like... I I <clears throat> I still am doing my dailies, but uh, I'm also doing some story. There's like a few dungeons that are new that I get to do, so cool. Yeah, and it's like I, every honest, patch. I'm really good at asking people questions about games I'm knowledgeable about. I know nothing about Final Fantasy. Yeah, every patch they add like I don't know three four hours of story. Okay. And like, there's been several patches since I was last playing. So, so you've got like 15 hours of snor st snorry? Wow. Story uh, to yeah, work your way through. something like that. I don't know. I'm not great at knowing exactly how long. Plus, I'm a slow reader and I get distracted by um, dailies and stuff. Because usually while I'm going through story, I'm also queuing up for dailies. So it's kind of hard to know exactly how long they are. Gotcha. It's at least a couple hours worth, though. That sounds like a nice bit of bite-sized story content for a... Mm -hmm. It's like getting a few new episodes for a TV show you like. Yes, it's exactly that way. And then they... I think they do patches, like, every six weeks. Okay. So mm -hmm. subscribe for three months a year. Yeah, I mean, if you want. Uh, but then, like, every three years, I think, they do a new uh, expansion. Ah, and okay. an expansion is like a hundred hours of gameplay at least, bare minimum. <laughs> that's 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 a lot. It's good. I love it. Speaking of good and love it, um, <laughs> I'm gonna talk your ear off about a dwarf fortress story for a minute here. Yeah, go for it. So, so I I had a a, 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 a an audience member jump into the chat and request a dwarf. Okay. And they were like. I want your most useless dwarf. Solid. I was like, well, everybody's kind of useful. So I was scrolling down the list and I noticed something out of the ordinary. I had a pump operator. And I was thinking like, man, I haven't done anything with pumps in the last, this stream. And I realized to my horror, I'd assigned a pump to be, to pump out a small zone in the stream before. Mm -hmm. um, so this dwarf had been pumping this one pump for about four years was oh. a legendary pump operator okay. was very bored because he hadn't seen his family in a really long time but was very satisfied at work um, so was trying to pump lava out of a little hole and there was no lava in it now the way the game's job assignment works is it the dwarf that has the best skill who's available is assigned to the task so the way the game's behind the scenes like job management works is it essentially just like removed this dwarf from the work pool because eventually they like became the best pump operator. Meaning I had this dwarf pumping 24 seven day and night until they got too thirsty and had to cancel the job and go get a drink and eat something and then go sleep and then go back for like four years. The dwarf disdains power, uh, which obviously I took to mean that they hated power because power would take their job away because you can use power to power the pumps. Mm -hmm. Um, was very antisocial and was uh, super happy and uh, confident in their life because they were they'd mastered a skill. Um, <laughs> so because of this, <laughs> and because of the hysterical laughter that this caused, I've now made that dwarf a um, a pump operating guild. 
um, which is completely built out of gold with the most valuable pump I could put together made out of adamantine and gold. And uh, this dwarf is now going to give pump operating lessons to all of my dwarves. I love it. I feel so bad. So you're Let talking like liquid or so water long. pumps, right? It's well, yeah, for for water or lava. Okay. Really, are the two things that you can pump with pumps? Yeah. Um, but you can like you can automate them with water wheels and stuff, so that they just move the water automatically. Mm -hmm. um, but this one I hadn't because it was just like a tiny little puddle that had some lava in it that I was emptying and filling. Oh. Uh... Because stuff kept getting stuck in it because I was testing some minecarts trying to fill minecarts with lava. Anyway, um, but uh, I needed to remove it to get the minecarts out sometimes. And uh, yeah, anyway, long story short, I just left the, the job running. And a dwarf like lost multiple years of their life doing absolutely nothing of value. I love it. Yep. Yep. Talk to me about Zomboid. Yeah. What are you currently up to? I've been doing a 16 times population run, which basically means that you have an absurd amount of zombies everywhere and, like, actually moving to go anywhere is pretty much impossible. Mm -hmm. So, I've been in the city with the least population, Riverside, which is actually a town in Project Zomboid that I haven't explored yet. And it's been a time because I pretty much can barely get outside of the neighborhood that I have managed to make a base in. Um... I've lived for a month in game, I think, now, and I've gotten, like, 3,000 kills, which is really, really good for me. You know, like, usually I don't do that good, so it's, like, really hype. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's hard, dude. Um, I literally will only stream it for two or three hours because I don't want to get tired and then make a stupid mistake. You know, because... What's, what, what's the death count, though? Like, how many how many attempts have you done? This is my first attempt at 16 times population. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. No, I expected it like the first stream I did of it. I was like, all right, so we're going to like do a few attempts. We'll probably do like five, six attempts before we can even get a base down. First attempt. I am still running on it. And it's been like six streams. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Neat. <laughs> Good yeah, for you. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, um so it, it, has it made you approach the game? Because like I know that you've played quite a bit of like just mm -hmm. normal ass zomboids. So like, has it made you approach the way you play or your strategies differently? Yeah, I well, first off, I haven't been able to get power yet. I'm over a month into the game and I haven't been able to get power because I can't loot places very quickly. And then like also looting is like way more scary because there's like so many zombies in the building. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like every building has at least so how, two, three zombies in it. How how has that changed the way you play you play the game? It's because, just slower like, you, and like I'm slower? actually having to use canned food and uh, my perishables go bad instantly pretty much and you know, uh, it's just like really slow going because you know, I'm just like trying to find, currently I'm trying to just find a medical center so I can get some beta blockers and vitamins, which are like the things that stop you from panicking when fighting and vitamins like give you energy. Um, and I have not been able to get to a medical center yet. I mean, I haven't even found a gas station yet. <laughs> um, oh boy. And what, what town are you playing in? Riverside. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I haven't found a gas station. I have not found a medical center. I... I mean, like, you have to know where they are, right? Yeah, or find them. Are I don't they, know like, where they are. Placed? I haven't played Riverside before. Oh, okay. So, so you're in a, in a, in a new town then. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, new, it's a town that's new to me, right? Sure. Uh, yes. I know Muldra really well. I know Rosewood really well. Um, gotcha. I, I know Riverside really well because that's where I always drive through with the car whenever I do goofy stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, have not or yet actually, found I go the from river. Moldra to Riverside. I have not yet found the river part of Riverside. I'm barely starting okay. to get into some like downtown area, I think. I found gotcha. like a building, like an L shaped building that has like a bunch of stores in it. Have you had any near misses that are fun to talk about? Any near misses? Uh, a couple, but usually it's just when I get tired. Okay. I just get tired and then, like, I mess up or 
the targeting in the game can be a little bit weird. It can be hard to know exactly what zombie you're targeting, and it can, like, mess you up. Um, gotcha. I mean, at the very beginning, I literally spent, like, the first few in-game days inside of a forest. Just, like, trying to get like, enough of lost? a weapon. Mm -mm, I was foraging because or... I needed a weapon because I didn't have a weapon at all. And, like, oh, the wow. forest, there's way less zombies, so you're safer there. But there's also way less food, unless you have scavenging. Yeah, you have to scavenge for food. So I was, like, constantly scavenging, trying to stay away from the zombies. Just um, Until I was able to make, I think I made a spear, and then I was able to kill enough zombies to get more weapons to slowly inch into the place where I settled. What's your current gear kit? What, what, what you wielding? Um... I am changing weapons constantly because they break so fast. <laughs> um, the most recent stream, I did one-handed weapons, and then I had another bag in my other hand. Um, I think I have a good number of crowbars and two-handed weapons, so I'm probably going to switch to those next stream, which will be Friday night, um, the day that we're recording. So it'll have already happened by the time you guys watch or listen to this podcast. Um... And, yeah, it's it's basically whatever you have access to. Um, I've gotten two machetes already, which is really exciting. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I've wacky, learned wacky. that uh, once you patch them about four times, it's not worth patching them anymore. But the first, like, four patches are definitely worth it. Do you have a vehicle currently, or are you still I cars? have, like, a little sedan. Okay. It's all I could get, and keeping it gassed up. He's driving insane. around in a Prius. <laughs> oh no, it's like you know the game's like from based in like the eighties, I think, or nineties. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just like, like a standard blue back. sedan. Yeah. But the issue is, is I'm struggling to keep enough gas. But the distance that it is, I am from my house is really annoying to run. So I try to keep my car gassed up so that. I can do that, but the thing is, the only gas I can get is from siphoning from other vehicles right now, because I don't have access to power. Yep. So it's just the whole thing. Yep. yep. Yeah, I, I feel you on that. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the end of mm -hmm. the power for our game section, so maybe we should go to news. What do you think? Yeah. All right, let's do a real quick break, and when we come back, we will talk about the uh, a couple news stories that have happened this week. I'll be right back. And we're back with episode 55 of the Halcyon Frequency Podcast. I'm blind hosting, and I'm here with Suey. And uh, we're going to talk about some news that's happening in this week. So the first one is a little bit interesting, but um, I think it's probably just a, a, like a little quick touch-in. Uh, some of you may have played the video game Back 4 Blood, which originally launched uh, to a lot of controversy as it had some pretty crappy online-only requirements. Um, but uh, Turtle Rock Studios, developers of Back 4 Blood, uh, as well as several other games in the past that you may have heard of, um, but uh, Turtle Rock uh, posted this on their website the other day, which says, Greetings, cleaners! Uh, what an amazing year in 2022 was for us. First off, we wanted to thank you all for making Back for Blood what it is today. Three expansions, uh, and which I will skip the names of, and we've we've traveled through a fantastic adventure together beyond the walls of Fort Hope, and this phase of our war against the Ridden uh, now comes to a close. The Ridden are the zombies in the game. Uh, Turtle Rock Studios has actually is actually a pretty small studio for making triple a games and we don't quite have enough folks to continue working on back for blood content while we spin up another game so it's time for us to put our heads down and get to work in the lab and uh get to work on the next big thing um and then they're saying it, it this is not a goodbye back for blood will continue to operate uh in fact back for blood is currently offered on playstation and plus and blah 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 and various other platforms for uh as for uh, as part of xbox game pass and whatnot so if you're paying for one of those services you may already have access to the game and uh they they also state that you'll find them hanging hang out in all their social media platforms so i just i i think like this is just you know more of a reason to uh push developers away from focusing on live service 
uh, offerings. I mean, uh, a lot of the the DRM and the online only requirements have been removed from Back for Blood, which I think is good. But um, you know, just kind of as a reminder, games aren't going to be developed forever, and uh, there are some games like this one that are kind of intended to be games that people put a large number of hours to with a group of people, and like hearing that they are moving on entirely from a game like Back for Blood, you know, uh, a f- largely a AAA follow-up to Left for Dead, which was a game that was, you know, is, is still played now, right? Um, I, I think it's a little bit sad to hear that they're moving on entirely, but, um, you know, looking at the reviews right now, um, they're, like, the, the audience is pretty mortified. Um, people are very much, like, the, the top review right now is this game is now officially left for dead, um, which, hmm. y- you know, I it, it kind of just, I, I hope that they, like, release some sort of mod support or some sort of community development tools so that the community can continue to build on this game because of people people do like it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's kind of sad to hear that support's not being pulled entirely, but... To my knowledge, that game still doesn't have custom servers, right? So if they do, for some reason, decide to turn the servers off, it's largely a, a, a dead game, um, yeah. which I think is a bit of a shame. Um, the one thing I know is in my job search, I have seen them uh, hiring, so they're expanding their team. Mm-hmm. But there's, as they said, still too small to work on Back for Blood. But then again, I also I don't know how well Back for Blood is selling right now, right? It might also just be a, a, a sign that, like, Maybe it was too expensive. Maybe um, it didn't quite live up to what people wanted from a, a follow-up to a Left for Dead. You know, it uh, kind of seems like a, a saddish story, that one. Yeah. Well, but a little bit of a, a different subject. Uh, do you, do you want to head this one off with uh, uh, the, the TwitchCon leaks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was leaked like a week ago, I think, that TwitchCon might be in Las Vegas. There was a uh, web page for TwitchCon saying TwitchCon Las Vegas, October 20th to October 22nd, 2023. Um, however, that link for it has changed to just say CHP event, October 16th, October 23rd. So Which has changed to the original events. So this, this was originally leaked out on Twitter, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then was later confirmed by one Zach Bussy. Um, it was actually this confirmed is... in the email he sent out because he sends out like a newsletter. Yes. And it was confirmed when the leak happened. Mm-hmm. Um, however, CHP, all I can find for those words on Google is California Highway Patrol. And it's also for a yeah. week now instead of a weekend. So... So I, I don't I don't know if that's the the link changing or maybe they just hid this event again because there's lots of events that happen in Las Vegas all the time right, um, and the the 16th to the 23rd of October which is the window now from the original like I think 20th yeah the, it was originally 20th to the 22nd which is a, a Friday Saturday Sunday three day event um, uh, what was shifted I I know that like when when the when this dropped and like the leak happened there was a lot of criticism immediately thrown at them because the the original dates october 20th to october 22nd is the exact same time window as the when we were young festival which you may have seen um photos of last year if you're on social media at all which is just that hey it's like sum 41 and blink 182 and every other like pop punk band from the early 2000s doing a show together like green day and um mm. just a giant festival right so my, my my assumption was oh well twitch staff just wants to go <laughs> <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but uh, they probably all have tickets already uh, but it it would make flights way more expensive so now that like the date leaked out I wonder if this date was not on lock yet maybe they're shifting it or alternatively maybe they just like made it hidden on the, the, the website where you can sneak past and take a peek at because that's also definitely possible the website that it's available on is book.passkey.com um, which is basically just like a you can book a hotels and uh, mm-hmm. convention centers and whatnot for your event service so it's an industry site it's not a uh, front-facing promotion site so this this wasn't promotional material so maybe they were like thinking about a date and now they're shifting it it's hard to say because like twitch yeah. use dates aren't announced yet so yeah and usually they wild because that's in first. just a couple months yeah. oh wow really is it only in a couple months it's in july that's in a couple months oh gosh <laughs> yeah 
So, um, like, we're in February, so March, April, May, June, July. That's, like, yeah, like, ha less than half a year away. Uh, and that's in Paris. So, you know, I, I, I don't think Twitch is going to turn around and announce the dates. So maybe what we're seeing here with the CHP event is uh, just they hid that and replaced it with a different event that is confirmed or something. No. Um, who knows? But uh, weird leak, TwitchCon might be in Las Vegas, might not be in Las Vegas. We, we don't, don't know. We don't know. But you know what we do know? Uh, the streamer awards are happening for nominations. So, uh, Suey, this is this is your soapbox. Go nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, guys, uh, there's a thing called the streamer awards, and there is a category on it called best philanthropic event stream event, which the description is the best event streamed for philanthropy, such as raising money for charity, spreading awareness, and other such incentives. Well, we as Halcyon kind of run an event of that kind called the RimWorld Hot Potato. If you guys want to just type a RimWorld Hot Potato into it, we'll put the link for this into the podcast description probably, hopefully. Um, Arch, put it in the podcast description. <clears throat> yep, hopefully. Um, and then this is a thing that would be like really, really cool if you guys could nominate us. And the nominations end on February 11th. And... It'd be really cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's also other things that people on the stream team do qualify for if you want to nominate people. Like, uh, both myself and Arch technically could go for a uh, Hidden Gem Award, which is a streamer with less than 100 uh, average viewers during 2022. That's going to be an interesting one to see who gets it. I know, right? It'll probably be someone that we don't know because, you know. Hidden. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I it's just a uh, hope that maybe people so could nominate the hot potato. Oh yeah, Bellinaire could too. Yeah. Personally, for me, I I I I don't feel like I I qualify for any awards, so I'm not going to push anything. But uh, I, I will. Nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, if people want to nominate me for things, they can nominate me for things. I. I, I'm not going to push it. But what I will say is, uh, please, yes, definitely uh, nominate the RimWorld Hot Potato uh, event for the Philanthropic uh, Charity Event Award. Um, because, you know, that'd be cool. It, it would be nice to, uh, you know, see us get, or I guess you even, Suey, um, <laughs> properly time. credited for, uh, you know, raising $130,000 for charity. Yeah, it'd be kind of scary, though, because, like, if you, I believe if you get nominated as one of the final nominees, you get invited and stuff, which would be very scary. Yeah, why would that be scary? You'd go on a, on a trip. Because I'd, like, end up being with, like, some really, really cool people, you know? Yeah, and? I I'm awkward, and I have anxiety, yeah. and... Same. Do I need to say more? And? And? <laughs> and? <laughs> and anyway, I think it's time for us to end this podcast. Uh, so I just want to say thank you, Zoe, for helping me co-host today. I, yeah. I, I hope that you had fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, you know, it's a little bit shorter because it's just the two of us this week. We're, we're messing around with some new formatting things. So you'll we'll, we'll be doing some themed episodes and some other things. So uh, it, the, the numbers might seem a little bit lower on attendance recently, but that's because we're gearing up for cool things in the future. And uh, Suey, I just want you to take this opportunity to yell about who you are and where people can find you on the Internet. Yeah, I'm Suey. Um, I, I stream on Twitch. It's Suey, S-U-W-E-Y. Um, so it's twitch.tv slash Suey. Um, I do a large variety of things, but I've been a little bit obsessed with Zomboid since, like, October. Um, that's still going strong. Um, I'm Halloween also hasn't ended Halo. yet. Perfect. Huh? Halloween hasn't ended yet. Perfect. <laughs> and then I have a YouTube. My main YouTube channel is youtube.com slash at Suey. Um, and then if you want to find my VOD archive, it's at Suey Streams. And then my Twitter is at Suey Streams as well. And I'm blind. You can find me at B-L-I-N-D-I-R-L on basically everything. And if you just type in Dwarf Fortress Blind, you'll find me on YouTube. Uh, if you want to follow me on a social media platform, I recommend Mastodon. M -A, blind IRL at M-A-S dot T-O is where you can find me on Mastodon. Because screw Twitter. And uh, I mean, I'm there too, but like 
Mastodon Con. And uh, mm-hmm. if if uh, if you want to get more episodes of this podcast, you can find that at halcyonfrequency.com. If you want to talk about this podcast, I recommend joining our community Discord. Links on the website. And uh, if you want to help out this podcast, leave us a review anywhere where you listen to the podcast. Optimally iTunes, because that's the one that actually matters. But if you leave us a review anywhere, that that's helpful. Uh, potentially, I, I would even say, like, you know, like, you don't even need to leave a review. You just need to, I don't know, say yes or something. Or, like, write rubber duck and leave a review. You. Um, it doesn't matter how many stars you give us, but I think we're a five-star podcast personally. <laughs> and um, if uh, if the podcast doesn't appear in a place where you listen to podcasts, please reach out to me and I will make it appear there. I just want to say shout outs to uh, Peter Pohl and Paul Mile for the wonderful intro and outro and break music that you hear. And uh, until next week, we air episodes go live on Sundays. This has been Halcyon Frequency. Don't touch that dial. Signing off. I think I screwed up the outro. Until next week, this is Halcyon Frequency. Don't change that dial. Signing off. Perfect.